see that if you want to save the river, you start at the ridge line. If you want to save the sea, you start at the summit. And we're really looking at this integrated, connected whole. And I'm always interested in, in, in marketing and the mnemonics, the memes, they call them these days. The meme, like how do we infect each other with the sense of connectivity and most it's for selling things. And have people seen this, this campaign's been pretty uh, effective on the folks in Lake Tahoe. Bumper stickers are everywhere. Keep Tahoe blue. And I think it's been really effective and I'm trying to figure out for you all, like, you know, what does Keep Okanagan blue look like? And thankfully, though, I was happy to see that the folks at the water board there have your one valley, one water concept. And that that resonates with me. And I'm, I'm glad, you, you know, that there's a sense of the connectivity that what unifies your collective community, this is where I get back to basins of relations, is the relationship that's shared within your system is basically a water defined. It's a topography, geology, hydrologically defined community boundary. I know you've got little cities in between, but at some point the water becomes the lubricant within the connective tissue of, of, your, of your community. And I don't know if folks know Luna Leopold. He was the son of Aldo Leopold, who was a very famous conservationist in America, he wrote a book called Sand County Almanac. And this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And so finding something like water, both quantity and quality, back to the two Q's, for sure. You gotta, if you're watching your P's and Q's, you better watch your Q and Q. Uh, that water in its health, that's your principal measure. Water won't lie to you. It's crazy honest in that regard. And so if we go back to the big level, back up to planet water for a second, then the health of the water on the planet is a principal measure of how we've been living on the land and the relationship of how it's performing, how it's behaving, becomes of paramount interest, which is why I'm back to supporting that notion that in the adaptation side of climate change, using the water cycle as the driver for design has the best opportunity to get us to all of the other land uses that we're worried about. And there's been a bunch of data on, on climate change, and I don't think you need to listen to all the scientists to tell you climate change is happening. It's pretty clear it's happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was in Brazil in 2008, and I can tell you that that's a big bathing suit on Ipanema Beach. <laughs> and in 2010, the naked truth of the matter is, as far as I can tell, is the game on. Right? And it's not when climate change happens. Some of the stuff we saw in the, and from Prince George in the other panel earlier, they've got data for 50 years showing that these curves are already being impacted. So we're, we're already deep in the midst of climate change. It's not a, this is not a future science fiction story. And some of this uh, kind of information from the IPCC here, even though this is 07, what it missed, what's not on here is, is ocean acidification. But everything else, the average air and ocean temperatures, this widespread melting of snow and ice, and this global mean sea level. Here's the deal. Every foundational expression of global weirding on planet water is a water-based indicator. It's got to be. The, the thermodynamics of this planet trying to adapt to an increase in heat via the thickening of the blanket, this greenhouse effect, which is super cool, but you're in bed and I'm going to put a blankie on. And then I'm going to put another blanket on. And I'm going to keep layering blankets on the bed and you don't get to kick a leg out. How are you going to respond? Your, your water body, you, you're going to have to sweat and you're going to darn well try to change the phase state from a liquid to a gas. Because that's a cooling reaction. It's just the straight chemistry of it, right? Well, the planet's got one trick up its sleeve better. It's just going to flat out melt every scrap of solid it can find. And we know this from what's happening in the, in the, up in the poles and and up on the ice caps and in the Arctic and even in Greenland. Like this ice cube is in the drink already. When, when the Arctic, that floating ice melts, change in elevation of sea levels may in fact, right, ice because it's got air in it in certain ways has, you don't necessarily get a total rise in, in elevation, but that ice cube sitting up there or the stuff that's on your mountains or on the glaciers in the Tibetan plateau, what they call the third pole, there's the North Pole, South Pole, and then the Himalayas called the Third Pole. The recession of those glaciers, that water isn't in, in, the, in the drink as of yet, in the glass, in the ocean, right? And I'm really interested in this change in, and both of the, the few talks I heard about climate change and the predictions had a lot to do with what I saw for you all, which resonates with what we're, our models are telling us for California, which is basically, 
precipitation will either remain similar or even go up for the most part on average, but what's gonna change is what phase state you're getting it in. And in general, we're looking at more liquid and less solid, which relates to increased runoff in the winter, increased flows and flooding to that extent, and less <coughs> solid water stored high up in a system to leak out late in the season and keep those reservoirs or groundwater recharged. So we're gonna get a faster movement of the cycle of the freshwater cycle going back to the ocean faster and faster. In my state, 80% of California is dependent on Sierra snowpack. And the predictions down there are basically that at 7,500 years out, we very likely will have many winters with very little, less than 10% snowpack in those mountains out there. So it's a big deal. And remember the slide that said global mean sea level? It didn't say global nice sea level rise. It said it'll be nice when the sea level comes up because it's all changing. That 97% ocean, 2% solid, 1% fresh, the loser in the game is the 2% solid, and the winner is the ocean for the warming trend. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into rapid onset cooling and how quickly the glacier's coming back to the Okanagan, but we'll leave that for a little ways out. But here, if anyone's been to the Bay Area, San Francisco is on this peninsula, Marin County, I live up here in Sonoma, and the blue, dark blue is the current shoreline, and the light blue is an estimate of a one meter sea level rise. So Sacramento in the Central Valley through our delta, right, that's predicted to be basically inland sea with a one meter sea level rise. We're up eight inches by record under the Golden Gate in the past hundred years already. And our governor, Schwarzenegger, his blue ribbon delta panel, their conservative estimate is, is that this prediction looks to be fairly solid out at a 75 year horizon. So I'm of the, I've, my wife calls me a preparanoid, but I'm, I'm of the mind that planning is best done in advance. <laughs> and so give me the data, just give us the data and then we'll wrangle with the adaptation to the implication of the data. But as far as I can tell, we're gonna have a lot more affordable housing where I come from, right? That's housing you have to ford through the water to get to, that's affordable, no, right? It makes some critters wonder what's up with the hominids here. They're, it'll be safe to cross the lily pad at some point with our western pond turtle. I got the turtle peak over here, I got a problem. So hopefully you have a sinking feeling at this moment. You're like, oh, dude, you're bumming me out. Um, <laughs> the folks who survived this big sinking change in paradigm here, call it your titanic change, are the ones that get themselves in a lifeboat. And I would argue the lifeboat you're looking for is called a watershed. It's from stem to stern, around the rim, the basics of the three-dimensionality as a topophiliac. The three-dimensionality, if you were to cup your hands and see the rim of your fingers and the creeklets and the, the main stem of the river between your palms and it empties at the delta of your wrist, that living lifeboat is what you all got going on. And in this case, for this talk, it's the Okanagan lifeboat. And you all know your geography way better than I do in your places and such, but from the top end to the bottom, and then you're worried about, okay, these folks, well, whose water are they using and who has the right rights to it and water quantity's coming off and quality's going and where are the fish moving? Are the adults getting through and are the babies getting out and where's that phosphorus coming that, that Stu talked about? And I think when you start thinking like a watershed, you realize you all are, those of you who live in this lifeboat together, share this common relationship. You may have your parochial city-based rivalries, but at some point, when the the you know stuff hits the <clears throat> the fan there banding together lifeboat by lifeboat watershed by watershed to retrofit and and rework or uh, with new construction land use practices that improve resiliency and performance in water quantity and quality and soil retention and in carbon sequestration and biodiversity and in in your built infrastructure your lifeboat's either going to float better than those that didn't or not and I'm interested in supporting all the lifeboats and getting their act together, i.e. watersheds, so it's not a NIMBY syndrome. But, and, and obviously your all's lifeboat here is, is sort of a little small one on the big, right? So you gotta figure out how to get a whole Columbia Basin ocean liner to sort itself out. But, but it is worth fractaling up to a scale that you feel like you've got some relationship to. And so the Okanagan has merit in just thinking about it, although it's not disconnected by any stretch, right? And the fun part is, is everybody basically lives in a watershed on the planet, and so 
we have the opportunity to do this kind of work at a global level that has universality, but drill it down to a local level that, that's custom to place. So there's a scale linking uh, potential here. And for me, again, if, if water is the principal measure of how we live on the land, then these organisms like totem salmon, these Chinook in this case from the Eel River down in, in Humboldt County, are kind of the charismatic canaries in the coal mine. And are they doing well or not is, is an interesting indicator, a benchmark for your human settlement. Fascinatingly enough, a fish like that, say a 50 pounder King Chinook, started out as a little egg in the gravel and a little baby and then headed out and spent three years plus out in the ocean, got super fat, swims all the way back up, assuming it can get back up, dams and barriers and all that kind of stuff, spawns and then dies, right? And in that death is what? Oh, it's the nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium and calcium. Studies down in Oregon looking at the needles in a Douglas fir tree and at Nadromus, salmon bearing watersheds. 60% of the nitrogen in the needle is of marine origin isotopically. They're looking at grizzly bear bones up in the, I wonder if I can go back to this guy. My family cabin is, is up here off the Henry's Fork of the Snake River in Idaho. And we used to be able to get fish all the way to there. And they took a grizzly bear that had been shot in 1872 when Yellowstone was made a park. And the museum folks, they went in and sampled the calcium from that bone some years ago. 50% of the calcium in that grizzly bear bone was of marine origin isotopically that far away from the coast. And grizz didn't make the trip. <laughs> so the importance of these fish, besides the fact that they taste good and they probably pair well with an Okanagan Pinot Noir, <laughs> is, um, is that these critters, and for you all, from my understanding here, you're basically your sockeye kokanee, interesting conundrum. We have steelhead and rainbow trout, same kind of thing, right? They're steelhead if they're anadromous, and they're rainbows if they stay, and your kokanees if they stay, and they're sockeyes. And, and apparently you had an amazing sockeye run. From what I've been being told, you just had an incredible. The, the capacity of the planet to surprise the heck out of you and resiliency and come back is about the only thing that keeps me hopeful. And if we want to work with nature, she's willing to play and do the right thing. And these fish, as far as I can tell, are a totemic critter that kind of holds your feet to the table of honesty. And there's a wonderful book by this gentleman, Freeman House, called Totem Salmon. It's about a Matoll watershed in Humboldt County, in California. This idea that the first thing they learned uh, was the importance from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception. And that helps out with my thinking like a watershed realm. And so it really gets me to the fact that the most important place to start in the watershed generally, you know, is the headwaters. And I'm supporting you all recognizing that the most important headwaters to start in is the water in your own dang head, right? You gotta get this up here. And so the game with this is how do you mitigate cerebral imperviousness first? <laughs> to infiltrate the information and make the change and get rid of the hard-headed, old-school, hydro-illiterate land use mismanagement practices and so this conference as far as I can tell is a great opportunity for cerebral imperviousness mitigation and that leads me to the work of the day that I'm up to basically is ecosystem restoration. <laughs> a new storyline within the ecosystem. What does the ecosystem believe? And then we can get to ecological restoration but if the hominids don't get on board with it in a good way the fish and the water and the trees and the rocks they're not the problem. It's, it's us, right? We have met the enemy and it, and it is ourselves kind of thing, right? So how do we do that? And it's about perception. And so this conference is a lot about perception, rain to resource. And so do you perceive stormwater as a problem? Because if you do, you'll pay pipe and pollute it. You, you will bow before the holy trapezoidal straight line channel. You think streamlining isn't just something you do for paperwork, but literally lining streams. There's the phrase form follows function. And there's also the corollary form follows dysfunction. And streamlined channels, as far as I can tell, are mm, less than ideal. And I usually get to rail on the Army Corps of Engineers when I'm <coughs> out. Or do you see water as a solution? And you're going to slow it, spread it, sink it. 